Hi everybody, welcome to Social Isch Issues Time. I'm Tildy Wajardo, and today we're gonna be having a discussion on mental health issues and women. And because of everything that's been happening out in the world and all the violence, and um, we just thought it was a, a great time to address a topic that might be uh, prevalent right now in our society. So we're really excited. I'm here with my co-host, Gothami Vemula. Hi everyone. And then also, um, I'm here with Dr. Brenda Richardson Rowe, who is the, a native of Dallas, Texas, and currently serves as a Minister of Counseling of the Harmony, Harmony Counseling Center at Concord Church, where her primary mission is to heal and grow people. And she is especially passionate about helping uh, women. Thank, thank you, thank you for, thank you for, thank you for being here. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> yeah. Excited to be here. So glad to have you. So, so yeah. tell us a little bit about how you um, got into the work that you're doing. Give people a little bit of background about how you ended up at, at, uh, at the Counseling Center. Alrighty. First of all, it was not my choice. <laughs> my choice was to be a registered nurse, which I did for about 26 years. Part of that time, I started to realize that I had a ministry call on my life which I attempted with all my might to run from. And I just wasn't very successful. And with that ministry call, it was also specific to me that it was in the area of counseling, which at that time, I don't know that I'd even heard the word counseling. So from there, I just trusted the call on my life and reluctantly went back to school because it was more education and counseling. And from there, just follow the lead and the call on my life. Concord is my church home and has been for a number of years. I've been a member there since 1980. And so it was just a great transition to serve my own church family as I transitioned into Christian counseling. That's wonderful. It's nice. Absolutely wonderful. So what has been, when you say that you're really passionate about you know, helping women, what have you seen since you started, you know, at Concord? And what have you seen that affects women most? One of the greatest things that I think that affect women the most has to do with the challenges of what's expected of us. So much is expected, especially in the arena of caring, for us to be responsible for caring and taking care of everything and everybody. And we proudly attempt to do that. But part of that process does not include taking care of ourselves and just helping women to understand how to have a healthy life with a healthy rhythm in all areas of life, in their spiritual life, in their emotional life, and in their physical life, and how that care of self actually equips them to better be positioned to care for others. Yeah. So can you make the distinction, because I think there's, there's a misconception out there between yes. mental health and mental illness. Absolutely. So many times when we just say the word mental, it's a problem. Right. And so we don't quite know the difference because we don't listen. Sure. We go all the way to one flew over the cuckoo's nest <laughs> when we hear the word <laughs> mental. And that's all we know. That's all we know. So because of that, we really have to take the time and help people to understand that we need to work to remain mentally healthy, just like we want to be spiritually healthy and we want to be spiritually healthy along with being emotionally healthy. We have to help people to understand that mental health is a good thing and it's far away from one flew over the right. cuckoo's nest. <laughs> and so just actually helping people to become aware and starting to, to help to remove a lot of the stigma and a lot of the misinformation and misconceptions about mental health and mental illness. Uh, so many of the times, even such words, just as depression, you can see the whole face of an audience change just with that word being said, just because we are not aware that depression is an emotion. And it's something that doing different seasons and issues of life, it's normal to be depressed. 
doing other seasons or for longer periods of time, then the depression can start to cause more long-term problems. So helping people to understand that continuum from mental health to mental illness, and for all of us, there's a thin line in different seasons and different times in our life that we're exhibiting some mental health issues just in response to life, and that's normal. What, um, what are some of the other mental health issues that women have to go through? I mean, from young adulthood and as they're getting older, or even some of the mental health issues that teenagers have to face. What do you see I, in your profession? One of the first ones that just sticks out with me is self-acceptance and learning to love you as who you are. Your eyes, your hair, your skin color, and truly believing that you are a beautiful daughter. You are beautiful. So many women spend their life, even little girls, wanting to look like or be like someone else. And as that focus is being something else, it takes away from the beauty that you have. Uh, a number of years ago, that became so apparent to me as I just watched women, just I'm a people watcher and especially women watcher, no matter where I am. So something that I started to do is part of me speaking to women. I will say, hi, beautiful. Hi, beautiful. And it is so amazing to see the response because so many women don't know that they are beautiful. So do you think it's the, the language that we use makes a huge amount of difference? It's the language that we use. It's many times how women are treated. It's the expectation of sometimes that it's imposed upon women that they are less than or that they can't accomplish the same thing that someone else should. And so you add all of those things together and it really lends itself to poor self-esteem. And there are times and places where, and people who just can read that, they can tell if you don't feel good about yourself. And I think, you know, I'm a huge advocate for positive psychology and I yes. talk about that um, yes. a lot. But one of the things that, that, uh, that we teach is the positive reinforcement of just not saying, you know, you're beautiful, but going even further, you're beautiful because, because. A, B, C. Exactly. And you reinforce that positive behavior or just characteristics exactly. and instill even more confidence with that, Absolutely. right? And so I think that's that's even more transformational for people. And it's well received mm -hmm. too, yes. you know, yes. and the facial expressions that you see when, mm -hmm. you know, you get positive affirmations like that, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. And so many women have not gotten those mm -hmm. in different seasons of their lives for many different reasons, sure. for many different reasons. And a lot of them have just been that people didn't know the responsibility or or even the impact are not of not giving those right. or of not giving those to girls or to daughters or to granddaughters but it's so amazing how early that starts and you start to see the impact something that has been going on a lot let's say the last eight to ten years are daddy daughter dances and right. daddy and that's really in the media and it's really promoting that daddies do things with their daughters and just to see the light light up and that little girl's eye that her dad is treating her well and that is teaching her to that she's worthy right. and then she grows up to expect right. to be treated well. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. That's wonderful. Absolutely. So what have been some, you know, we just came through a dark season here in Dallas yes. with with the shootings of the five police officers and their deaths and, and things and, and all the violence that has transpired, you know, over the past few months. What have what have you seen or what did you see directly after the um, the shootings here in Dallas and the violence that was happening, you know, in Baton Rouge and, and elsewhere? Absolutely. There were emotions all over the place. When you talk about a continuum mm -hmm. from the beginning to the end, um, people who were just shocked who were just in disbelief and traumatized by so many things happening so rapidly behind each other. So before you could believe that one thing happened, a second thing happened. And even those things were, let's say for those of us here in Dallas, those were away from us. So there's some safety that comes in that when it's over there. But before you could get to a place of really saying it was over there, it was over here. 
and it was in our own city impacting us. Our friends were in danger. Our fellow police officers were killed. So emotions just all over the place. People who are very, very stable emotionally, especially if they watched it over and over again. And it's so hard not to, because things like that are everywhere. They're on the media, they're on the radio, they're on the TV, but you can be so traumatized, not even being there to witness it by seeing that type of trauma over and over again. And then again, especially the people that were there, police officers that were there, police families that were there, people that were Marchers, we actually had an acts an incident to happen a couple Sundays ago mm -hmm. to at church where one of the members was actually one of the marchers and from her perspective had not really had any great impact from that. She remembers the fear and all right. of being that, but for her that was about it. But the drummer hit the cymbal mm -hmm. and in her mind it was gun shooting. And it for her, for that split second as she turned to run, yeah. she was back in that right. same place. Because sometimes trauma doesn't necessarily well, take effect at the point of crisis. Exactly. It can manifest it can much manifest later on, right? Much later. We're starting now to just now, this many weeks later, to start having people call that are having sleeping problems, okay. that are having nightmares, that are seeing things over again, or feeling unsafe, or feeling, is this police officer stopping me? Later. It's weeks later. It's weeks later that people start to have that type of impact. And so much of it depends on from what place of mental healthiness you're starting from. And then where were you? What, what impacted? For example, people that were actually in El Centro mm -hmm. and actually were locked in El Centro for that period of time would have had a much greater dramatic experience of what could because they couldn't run. Right. They couldn't get out. Because they were, because they were exactly, they were isolated. So those kinds of things, especially no matter where you are, it, it has an impact. So it's one of the things I tell people all the time, get away from the TV set. You know what's happened, you've seen it, don't just relive it. Don't keep just looking at it, but it really can cause a great amount of stress. Wow. So knowing that things like this will happen yes. again, you know, because the can of worms has pretty much been open now yes. and we're going to probably see it hopefully not at the scale that we have already, but you know, it's, it will happen again. What besides, you know, turning off the TV, what can people do to protect themselves, you know, emotionally from, from incidents like this? One of the very first things is what you just said, knowing that we live in a world that things are going to happen. Right. Not living in fear, but living in awareness uh, that things are going to happen. And that when they do, protect yourself and keep yourself as grounded to what is real mm -hmm. for your life and where you are as possible. Um, so many of the times we find people taking on emotions that are not dear to where they are, they're taking on the emotion as if they were there or if they were one of the ones that actually got shot. So you have to be very careful in terms of understanding, having the empathy for that and understanding, but that's not you. Right. You're not there and understanding those things. Uh, actually being able to respond to it, uh, being able to have things like it just happened the way that it happened, but my pastor was preparing to do something on Friday night to bring the city faith group together in the Southern sector in response to the first two incidents. Having no idea that by the time we got to Friday night, we would have experienced Thursday night here. And the number of people that responded because they are very strong in their faith mm -hmm. and the comfort that that bought for people throughout the city right. to get together, to hear and to pray and worship together, the safety in numbers that that bought. And those kinds of things have continued to happen throughout the city. Do you feel like um, the, the clinicians, our yes. clinicians today, do you think we focus, clinicians focus more on intervention versus prevention? How do you it feel about really that? It really depends on where that person's work is. Okay. Um, for example, if you're actually in practice mm -hmm. and you're making your living at practice, Actually, the prevention ends of it ends up being more of your hobby or what you give to that occupation. Because unfortunately, we don't pay for prevention. Right, right. 
We don't support prevention mm -hmm. in mental health nor in health, physical health. So, so many times you try to wrap it together. So if you're treating someone and there's something now that needs an intervention, along with that intervention, you want to also teach preventive methods. You want to teach healing methods. You want to teach coping methods. Because even though it's focused on this incident, life continues. Sure. And you will continue to have life issues where you will need to use different tools mm -hmm. to assist you in going through them and coping with them in a healthy fashion. So how did you cope with it? Um, and how did it affect you? My first thing, um, I think for me, is it's not my first rodeo. And what I mean by that, I've, I've gone through Katrina and been very active in those kinds of things, gone through serving people in trauma and Rolette. So I have had experience in very traumatic life situations. So it was not brand new to me for me. That was the first thing. And then secondly, I learned coping mechanisms for myself. I learned how to watch me, how to get the rest that I needed, how to go and go when I needed to go, and how to get those pieces of rest that I needed to. Because during that time, you're doing a lot, and you're going a lot, and your sleep patterns are off, and your eating patterns are off. So you take the best care as you can. And I would have to say my faith. My faith is what grounds me. And that gives me the courage because I don't have to have the strength. Sure. I don't have to have, I don't even have to have the tools. I have to be available to be used mm -hmm. as a vessel in those situations. And that brings me great peace. Because this field can definitely be overwhelming Absolutely. and very stressful. Absolutely. So you as a clinician must have, you have to take care of your own mental health Absolutely. too in order to help your help others. clients. And so many times people don't realize it, but we have families right. and, and we have lives. And some of the same kinds of things are impacting us that are impacting our lives. I lost my brother this past February suddenly. And I was teaching a class uh, at UNT Dallas. And when I, I took two weeks off and when I went back, I shared with them because we, we were talking about grief. And I, and I made them laugh because I know they were all like, oh, how do we help her? How do we support her? This is her first event. This is what grief looks like. And I kind of made it a joke, but it's really, I don't quite remember where were we when we left. And did I cover this the last session? I was here. And that's really what it looks like. So to talk it out and live it out because it's very real. It's very real. And in that, you're giving other people permission to talk it out. And let them know, hey, it's okay. And, and we're going to learn to just not judge you, you know. just And you don't have to go the road alone. Right. You don't have to live it in silence. And so much of the stigma mm -hmm. behind any issue, especially mental illness, has to do with you don't tell anybody. You just suffer in right. silence. And on the, you're talking about stigma. You mentioned stigma earlier in our conversation, too. Why do you feel there is a stigma for women of color to seek out therapy? Actually, personally, I believe so much of that in our history goes all the way back to slavery. Because what was actually depicted as a healthy woman and a strong woman was a woman of great resilience who could tough it through all of the tough times and all of the tough things and endure those things. So that message has come forward that it's not okay to feel, it's not okay to have emotions, it's the, it's the toughness, it's the go through, um, and it's the do it alone, not even seeking out from friends or family, certainly not from a counselor to seek out help and it's not okay to seek that help and having to actually teach awareness and teach that it's okay and what it looks like what that healthiness looks like and how practicing that level of healthiness actually prevents us from continuing to move towards mental illness it really does um, Winifred Errol in the uh, chat room would like to know how to differentiate between post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. and bipolar depression. Very, very difficult. First of all, that would have to start with a very, very sound assessment. When did symptoms start to show up? Uh, as we know, 
people, someone could already be diagnosed with bipolar and a traumatic incident that they witness or experience could actually trigger them to either go into the depressive end of their bipolar disorder or exasperate the excitement of that disorder. So you'd have to start with having a very clear assessment of that individual's mental health then to start. So is it specifically related to this incident? And when you look at history prior to that, they were sleeping well, they were able to work normally, they were taking care of their normal life issues and normal life patterns. And now these changes start to occur because they've experienced, then you would lean more towards it being related to the stressor, the drama and the, the, the actual post symptom, traumatic symptoms, as opposed to it being a disease process. But sometimes also a very severe experience can trigger the onset. So thin line of really assessing and seeing where things came from, where they are, and then the response to the treatment and the interventions that are used. So what would be some indicators that they may have those uh, pre or have a precondition to what are some indicators? Some, indicators? some of those, first of all, know that most mental illnesses have genetic predispositions, they have uh, lifestyle predispositions, and they also have environmental predispositions. So looking at some of those things, and that's why we go back to the assessment, as you assess the environment of that person, as you assess their lifestyle, mm -hmm. as you look at genetic background, is there any genetic history, as you start to put those things together that starts you to be able to formulate a potential diagnosis when you're looking at that client. Um, and then looking at those things of what's actually what they're presenting with now. What symptoms do they have? How long have they had those symptoms? Unfortunately, especially in treating people of color and more especially women of color, those symptoms they could have had a very long time before they seek help because of the stigma, because of not saying anything to anybody. So getting a sound history can really help you to help that client. And that's going to incorporate a lot of probing questions, exactly. really, really get into the exactly. depth of their history. And the person being willing to, to share. answer those and to right. share those. Yes. Wow. Well, I mean, I can I can share my own story with people. You know, I mean, I didn't want to go to counseling after a very traumatic childhood from the time that I was five till I was 12. And so going, suffering through childhood molestation, um, it wasn't until I was 17, probably, that I actually went to my first counseling session. And that's when I was turned off by counseling because, you know, to have a 17-year-old uh, look at a chair and tell them what you think, you know, or imagine that being your, your child molester, you know, I mean, that to me was just cuckoo. So, but anyway, it really, in my 20s is when I actually found um, a therapist, you know, and therapists that actually made a difference in my own life. And to this day, I have no problem telling people, I still go for a normal checkup. And that's just, just to check in, you know, to make sure that I am on, on a, a healthy track on an emotionally healthy track. Um, and sometimes, you know, there's some, some things that trigger emotions and, and I have to learn how to peel back those layers. Um, but there are things that I'm aware of versus, you know, just ignoring them. Exactly. And because you did seek some help, you were taught some tools and techniques that work for you. Counseling is a very, very personal journey. And in order to have a healthy journey, you really have to build a trusting relationship with a counselor. And just because we all have different personalities, and it's not necessarily the techniques, it's more the relationship right. yeah. and how you present the techniques. Once you build a trusting relationship and your clients can trust you, then they trust you to try a technique and then to say to you, I don't think I'm ready for that yet. Or is there something else? And then you can then journey with them to, through to another technique. But until that relationship, way too many times, especially driven by insurance, if you've got a client and they've got five sessions, yeah. 
and they are coming in with a traumatic incident, mm -hmm. too many times we jump to intervention right. without relationship, right. which does not help the client. Exactly. But that's so true. And I, the last therapist I had was the best. And I loved it because of her style. When I first went in there, she immediately told me, you know, um, life is serious, but that doesn't mean that we have to be. Right. You know, we're going to laugh. We might cry. Um, she says the second thing is that counseling is temporary, not permanent. Not permanent. She says, I'm going to assess you the first couple of times that you come in to see how many sessions it might take. She says, then I want you to go out there and do life exactly. and practice what we've learned. Exactly. And to me, that was so refreshing. refreshing. <laughs> you know? That's something I have to tell my clients all the time. You're yeah. not going to move in here with me. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be here very short period yeah. of time. And then I want you to go out there and yeah. I want you to do your life. Right. And I'm also going to position you to help someone else yes. do their life exactly. better through what you've learned. You know, that's real life. One of the things that I've come across, you know, when talking to friends or just, you know, other people, sometimes counseling is equivalent to it's a taboo. Oh my goodness, if you go to counseling, then there's something wrong with you. And I want everyone to understand there is nothing wrong with going to a counselor and getting a third party Absolutely. objective. Sometimes it's very healthy. You're taking care of your mental health. Exactly. Just to talk and get a third party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, self care. Sometimes I use the word let's talk. Right. Come on, just let's talk. Sit down and talk with me. Um, when Katrina hit, because of so many of the people coming in to Dallas mm -hmm. and our church being right on 20, a lot of people were coming for help and assistance. And of course, we knew they were going to need counseling. And so we had this area all set up and ready with therapists and information and everything we needed that said counseling. Well, the first day, we spent a lot of time together as therapists because there weren't many people coming. And one of the therapist students said, Dr. B, let's put up a sign that says, let's talk and see what happens. Well, at that point, I was like, let's try it. Yeah. It made all the difference in the world. We were doing the exact same thing, but because of what counseling meant, what right. the word meant, yeah. and the stigma that the word carries so many times until you can educate people and make people aware of it, they're not going to come towards counseling. Perception. Their perception of it. Well, I mean, Absolutely. when you think about it, mental health really, um, I think, or a lack of mental health is because people feel that they aren't being seen or heard. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. And so when you acknowledge them and you affirm them, I mean, that leads to Mental health. Mental health. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mental health. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's where so much of our work is. Yes. So much, you know, treatment can be available, techniques can be available. All of that is awesome. But if we're not doing the education and bringing people to the awareness mm -hmm. of mental health and what can be available and how it can change mm -hmm. and help you have a healthier life and how even there can be some things that it prevents you from dealing with because you've got coping skills. Right. You've learned some resilience. Until we spend more time there, we're never going to get people to the treatment end of it right. or to the resource end of it because that stigma is going to be the block exactly. to all of those things, even though they're right there. So we are at the end of our time, and I really want for you to think of two to three things that you would like for women to know yes. or to implement, you know, that can possibly change the course of, of their life. First of all, I think that everything starts with us. So first of all, looking at your own mental health and giving yourself permission to become educated, to become more aware. Um, one of the things that my spiritual mom said before she passed, and I will never forget, she'd always say, Brenda, just goggle it. Just goggle it. <laughs> I like and it. I tried forever <laughs> to goggle get it. her to Google. And I never got her to Google. She goggled, she goggled. everything. <laughs> so if you have to goggle it, just goggle it goggle. for yourself because as you gain information and you deal with your own stigma and your own fears, you're now better equipped to share that with others. With that, then becoming aware yourself 
And then lastly, I would say taking that awareness and put it to action. Put it to action first in your own sphere of influence and your own family and your own work and your own synagogue or church, making that awareness available to others. And for that, that becomes what I call my ministry, a ministry of multiplication. Because the number of people with that one that you're able to impact, they go out and impact five to 10 others who impact five to 10 others. And then the journey doesn't seem so impossible. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate so much. You're so welcome. Me. Do you have anything that you'd like to say to the audience? Um, you know, I encourage anyone, you know, if, if you feel like you need to, there's something wrong and you need to take care of yourself and you need to be checked in the sense that, you know what, I need to speak to somebody. Yes. I encourage you, go and talk to somebody. Yes. Don't let it manifest. Open up and speak. Yes. Yeah. And I would say the same thing along the same lines. You know, don't let shame or the fear of shame uh, keep you from from going out there and and just asking asking questions of a of a certified official, you know that's the best thing that I ever did for myself in my life, and I always heard people about talking about this unspeakable joy, and it wasn't until and I wanted that unspeakable yes. joy, and it wasn't until I pushed through that shame and went and got the help that I needed that now I do live that. Right. I do have that unspeakable joy. Not to say that I don't have problems or circumstances that arise, but I have that resiliency. I have that joy, you know, and yes. and there's nothing like that. And I want that for you. And so go after it. Absolutely. So thank you so much. You are so welcome. Dr. Uh, Brenda Richardson. Ro. Ro. Yes. <laughs> So if people want to get, get in touch with you, how would they do that? Yes. I'm the Minister of Counseling of the Harmony Counseling Center, which is the faith-based counseling center of the Concord Church. Um, Concord and the Counseling Center is in the southern sector, right off of 20. Our address is 6969 Pastor Bailey Drive, and that's 75236. You can also contact me at 214-751. Thank you so much, Dr. So Rowe. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Appreciate and it. And thank you for listening. Yeah, and again, if you if you like the content that you're watching, please share it with others. And don't keep us a secret. Um, you can find these uh, edited versions of Social Issues Time with Dr. Richardson Rowe on our U on the Woman R's YouTube channel. So be sure and check that out and follow us there and like us and like us on our Woman R's page and subscribe to our channel here so that you can become aware of all the all the content that we're producing here on, on Facebook Live. Exactly. So thanks for being here, guys. And if you have any questions, be sure and put them in the comments and we'll ask Dr. Rowe to engage with you with those comments as well. Thank you. See you soon. Thanks, guys.